Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Flora, deep in the heart of Mississippi, right smack dab in the middle. Hey, friends, I want you to come see us. When you get to Jackson, Mississippi, you're only 14 miles from Flora. So anytime you got to run up to Jackson for something or over to Jackson for something or down to Jackson for something, come see us in Flora. We would love to see you. Today is the last Sunday in September. Fall is upon us. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? And uh, they, uh, this is the year of the 2024. We have for since, uh, let me see, when was that? Y2K was New Year's Eve, 1999. So we're on the 25th anniversary of surviving Y2K. <laughs> we survived it. And uh, you remember that? And uh, all of these uh, things that so easily beset us. Friends, are you uh, enjoying a good year? I hope you are. I've been thinking about you. I think about you every day. I, I pray for you. Didn't you enjoy Roger Cunningham last week? Wasn't that tremendous? Two weeks from now, two weeks from t today, actually from yesterday, today is Sunday, and uh, but on October the 12th and 13th, the great one, the Reverend Dr. Bernadine Wormley Daniels from Detroit, Michigan, will be right here in Flora. She's coming to see us, and we want you to come to Saturday night at 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10.30, and then Sunday night at The Point. The Point is over in Brandon. And so uh, I believe it's on Brandon Star Road, I believe that's but you can just look it up on your phone. It'll take you right there. And uh, it's on the Brandon side of that. You know, you can, if you're, uh, however you get to Brandon, it, it'll be just south of town right there. Friends, uh, so you'll actually have three opportunities to hear her. And uh, in years past, whenever we were uh, fortunate enough to have, or blessed enough to have Bernadine here, we would take her to the airport on Sunday afternoon and get her home and, and uh, get her back to Michigan. Uh, her aged father lives with her, and she also has a, uh, a handicapped child that lives with her. It's her oldest child. Uh, and so Bernadine can't be gone long, but she'll be with us through Monday so that she will have plenty of time on Sunday to minister to people Sunday morning and Sunday night. We won't have to whisk her away. Friends, uh, are you going with me to Greece and Italy with a stopover? It's half cruise, half bus tour. We're going, we're going to cruise the Aegean Sea. We're going to uh, Santorini, to Mykonos, uh, Athens. I don't remember all the name of these Greek islands. We're going to Patmos, which is actually an island off of Turkey. And we are so excited about doing these. Crete, how about that? You can't have one of these without stopping in Crete. Corinth and uh, other places. And then we're going to spend the last four days, we're going to fly from Athens to Rome and spend the last four days in Rome. We're going to the Vatican and to the Colosseum and all of those places that you've seen in the movies. We're not going all over Italy Instead, we're going to do a deep dive into Rome itself. And so, but four days in Rome, and it's going to be uh, June the 4th through the 14th. Well, one size fits all. I, I, if you're flying from Jackson, Mississippi, friends, I've got everything down to. There's no extra calls for extra flights. Uh, I don't know what it'll be from your city, but I know what it'll be from my city. We have uh, seats reserved on American Airlines, although you might could get cheaper at Delta. You do not have to fly on our flight. You might could get a, a I know right now Delta will match those seats because that's where my frequent flyer miles are. But uh, you don't have to worry about that, all that, if you just sign up for this one. Or you could probably, if you fly out of New Orleans, it would be probably much cheaper for you. Uh, if you fly out of Atlanta, certainly it would be cheaper for you, but you may be flying out of somewhere else around the country. We want you to go with us. Treat yourself. One price. Uh, you're not under the gun to hurry up and get it in, but, but you might want to. Uh, we're going to try and have all this done by Christmas. But uh, some of you may have this brochure, but the latest one we have out has all of the prices 
and everything. The only thing you have to pay for out of pocket is your souvenirs, uh, your lunches, and that's about half the lunches you get. The other half are part of this program. Uh, all of your meals are covered except for lunches. Let me put it that way. And even, and, and probably a half or so of the lunches are covered. So I think you have about six or seven lunches that you have to pay for out of pocket and then uh, tips. And so that's it. We want you to go. It's next June. Then five days later, you might as well just set up camp right here in Mississippi if you're not from here. Because five days later, Joe and Miles Moody will be here for Flow River Flow, the 25th anniversary. I'll tell you more about that later. All right, friends, uh, grab your Bibles. We're going to talk about things uh, that have been uncomfortable. And, 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 and by popular demand, people have said, I, I guess... Uh, they want me to preach on different things than, than what I preach on, which is to come in glory. I preach on that. That's been a theme now for 19 years. I guess people are tired of hearing it. Tired of hearing about healing and deliverance and that kind of stuff. And they want to hear about stuff they heard about when they were a child. So I've been trying to be conscientious about that. And so I'm going. this is a put up or shut up sermon. Do you really want to hear this or don't you? And Because uh, I am going to the heart of the Gospel of Luke. If you say, oh, I don't want to hear about this, I don't want to hear about this, wait a second, no, 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 you said you wanted to hear about it, you're going to hear about it today. So look with me in Luke chapter 16, and let's see what the Bible says about this very important subject. Uh, what are we talking about here, friends? We're talking about uh, four surprising things about hell. Yes, sir, reference. You know, uh, it's been said a thousand times uh, that hell, it's been said billions of times uh, that hell was created by the church or it was created by the apostles. It was created to keep people in line. I watched the latest uh, uh, incarnation of uh, Robin Hood the other day on television on MeTV. Which was sort of a, which is place fifties and sixties TV shows, but they showed the twenty eighteen version of Robin Hood, and and in that one the Muslims are kind of the heroes, and the Crusaders are the evil people, and they have a cardinal uh, from the church, a church cardinal saying the church created hell to keep you peasants in line. <laughs> I laughed and I laughed. Hollywood always has to put its prominent proboscis in the middle of everything. Hell, uh, hell was not created by Hollywood. Uh, did you know that uh, uh, that Jesus introduces us to hell and says way more about it? Uh, than than any other Bible author, it 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 gets uh, it gets a glancing mention in in the in the epistles and uh, hardly hardly mentioned at all. Although it does appear in the epistles, but did you know that Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven? How about that? Isn't that something? So let's let's take a let's take a very serious look into the doctrine of hell. And we're going to read the, the very famous story from Luke chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, look with me in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. I'll give you just a second to look it up. And uh, as I begin to read, you will understand, uh, or not understand, you will remember this story this story uh we had uh, the country music singer here uh a few years ago and he brought a singer with him and uh i'll remember his name before the end of the sermon and uh the singer's name was uh, jeff bates and a very famous uh songwriter and and a, and a good singer but Wrote a lot of great songs, Conway in the vein of Conway Twitty, and uh, through a series of bad marriages and a series of bad decisions, he found himself in in uh, in prison 
and in prison he was delivered. That's a country music biography if there ever was one. Do you know he was adopted and uh, born, born in Mobile and adopted when he was a kid by a family in uh, Marion County, Mississippi, over, I think, at Bunker Hill, but I'm not sure. But he, anyway, he's a Mississippi boy, like all good singers are from Mississippi. Uh, I, dare, I, I dare you to uh, fact check that. That's just the truth. And he, uh, uh, and he found the Lord, and uh, and he spent a good bit of the part of, of his life telling people about Jesus, singing his country songs, and uh, and uh, paying back every everybody he had ever stolen from as as a meth addict. And and so I just appreciate that so much. And he came and he, he brought a guy. His name was Thomas. And uh, he was, uh, he w and he sang a song, and he written a song about uh, Luke from Luke 16. I'll find that song, and I'll put it on, I'll put it on Facebook, so you can find, so you can watch this later. I want you to hear this song. All right, friends, we are in Luke chapter 16. That little story gave you time to find it, and let's go to verse 19. There was a rich man who dressed in purple. Remember, uh, Lydia was a merchant in purple. That's that's the wealthiest color. It's just so hard to make that if you see somebody dressed in purple, it means they're the richest of the rich. And fine linen. And he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores. This is not Lazarus the priest that Jesus raised from the dead. This is a whole different guy. He was a beggar, and he, uh, maybe even a leper, but he had sores over his body, and, and the rich man didn't really care for him. And then the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Now in the Jewish understanding, this is the Jewish understanding of the afterlife as we wait our full redemption. So when a soul dies, and remember Christ hadn't died yet. Now when a soul dies, they go straight to the Lord. But, in, but before that, you went to a place called Abraham's bosom where you waited for Messiah to come and to save you. And so the unredeemed went to hell and those who were redeemed or those who died in faith went to the other side. And they waited. Remember, with Jesus, when he died, before he ascended, he descended. He went to Abraham's bosom and he set the captives free. Right? He, he descended to hell, as we say in the Apostles' Creed, if we read the entire one. Sometimes that's omitted because we uh, Methodists like to omit things that make us uncomfortable. But in the Apostles' Creed, he had descended to hell, right? And uh, in the original. And so... While they were waiting, there were the redeemed in, in Abraham's bosom being comforted, waiting for Christ to come or Messiah to come. Christ means Messiah. And while there were those others who were at, across a great chasm, great divide, and they were waiting the judgment. Holy cow, that's really something, isn't it? And so we see Lazarus, and Lazarus is... Uh, being comforted, but the rich man is just crying out. I mean, he's he's in torment. But you know, torment doesn't change your character. People who are people who are in hell are the same person always. He he he's a bigot. <laughs> he think even in hell, he thinks he's better than Lazarus. He didn't say, Father Abraham, please come over here and dip yourself in the dip a finger in, in the water and place it on my tongue. He didn't say that. He said, send Lazarus over here to do it. Send that boy. Send, send that Negro over here. You see, he's a bigot. 
send that send that trash that used to lay out out by uh, my gate. Let slept with the dog. Send him over here to serve me. He ain't coming over there to serve you, Mister Rich Man. No one is ever going to serve you again. No one is ever going to serve you again. Do you see? The flames of hell did not eat. It, it, was, it was licking his body, but it wasn't touching his old nasty soul, his old nasty heart. Listen to this, what he says, friends. Uh, the flames of hell doesn't change people's bigotry. Yikes. Is that I'm okay with that? No, you, you said you wanted to hear it. So hear it. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, and now he is comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, there is between us, you and I, a great chasm that has been fixed. Who fixed it there? God did. Hey, you remember when the flood came and the people were beating on the door of the ark, but Noah couldn't open the ark? How come, how come Noah couldn't open that ark? Because God closed the door. God closed the door. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from over there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They have preachers. Let them listen to their preacher. No, let them read it out of their Bibles. They have a Bible. Let them read it from their Bibles. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said, if they do not listen to Moses, if they don't believe the Bible now, they're not going to believe it then, even if someone is raised from the dead. How about that? Can you believe that? That is such a tough scripture. I will. I have reverenced this passage. I, 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 you know, I, I preach on hell. I never preach on hell. I never ever preach on hell. I guess I need to start because people seem to have an appetite for that, or they say they do, but they don't. Let me say this to you. I, but I reference hell, and then I always say, like Jesus said in Luke sixteen. But what I've never done, or I haven't done much, is actually read from Luke chapter sixteen. So people. So I think, well, I'm doing everybody a disservice, you know. And uh, I've always assumed that people who sit in my church and listen to me preach are saved and ready when they die. Because, uh, you know, I never told, I've never done a funeral save one where I got up and said the person's in hell. <laughs> you know, I, uh, that's, that's a big, that's a big assumption, isn't it, that everybody's going to heaven. The statistics on that, uh, people who, you know, George Barn and people like that who do statistics on those kinds of things have said that it, it, it could be as many as one in 11 church members are on their way to hell. One, uh, o or only one in 11 are on their way to heaven, 10 of 11 are on their way to hell. Because uh, you have to be born again and you have to and you have to live it. Christianity is to be, is faith without works is dead. It's a lived expression. And, uh, and if you're on your way to heaven and you're not concerned about others who are on their way to hell, then you're not on your way to heaven. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what he's saying. If you're on your way to heaven and it doesn't bother you that people are not, I mean, if you're concerned, if you're concerned about the social activities in the church, but you're not concerned about the people in your church that are going to hell, you got a real big problem. And the problem is not people around you going to hell, the problem is you going to hell. So let me tell you four surprising things about hell and then I'm gonna stop. I don't really care for the subject. <laughs> I believe in hell. I believe in hell. I spent the first part of my Christian life trying to avoid hell. I've spent the rest of the, I've probably, I'd say the first four or five years of my ministry worried about me going to hell. The rest of the time I spent worried about you going to hell. Let me tell you four surprising things about going to, about hell that I think that, that you're going to find surprising and that you're going to argue with me about. 
Guess if I'm not here to start an argument, why am I really here? <laughs> let's, look, let's look at the number one thing. One one thing the Bible teaches is about hell that you're gonna just gonna surprise you. One, God did not create hell with you in mind. Did you can you believe that? I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna give you the scripture for that. I'm gonna turn back to Matthew chapter 25 and I'm gonna read it to you because otherwise you wouldn't believe me. Matthew chapter 25, and let's look uh, down at verse 41. Jesus, this is Jesus talking about the sheep and the goats, the judgment the final judgment, and he says, then I will say to those on my left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Can you believe that? Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. He did not prepare hell for you. It's just a crazy circumstance that you're going to wind up there. But uh, the Bible says that uh, more people are going to go to hell than are going to go to heaven. It, Jesus said that. Billy Graham didn't say it. I didn't say it. The ba Baptist pastor over here didn't say it. The evangelist that came through town didn't say it. The TV preacher didn't say it. Jesus said that. Jesus said, uh, broad is the way that lead, and many people find it, that leads to hell. But narrow is the way, and few people find it, that leads to heaven. So Jesus said, more of y'all are going to go to hell than go to heaven. See, I don't believe that about you. But I believe that about us, about the human condition. I believe that uh, I, I just am optimistic. I just, uh, one thing is you have a preacher who doesn't want to go to heaven by himself. I want Sue Ellen to go, and I want my children to go, and I want my grandson to go, and I want your, you to go, and I want your children to go, and I want your grandchildren to go. And the people, who are, the, people, the people who are on my team, I want to go to heaven. But the people who are against me, I want to go to heaven. I want all y'all to go to heaven. And the people, who, uh, the people who treat me like I'm perfect, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Nobody treats me like I'm perfect. But if somebody were to, I would want them to go to heaven. I, I, need, I, I could use that little ego boost. But the people that treat me like I'm Adolf Hitler, I want to go to heaven. You know, I got kin folks that are voting for Trump. I want them to go to heaven. But that doesn't save them. And I got kin folks that are voting for uh, the other one, Kamala. I don't want them to go to hell cause, just because they're voting for the, you know, the village. Uh, let me move on from that. I, this, is what, <laughs> this is what I want, friends. I want as many people. I don't want anybody in my circle to go to heaven, to go to hell, because because God doesn't want you to go there. Uh oh, I I jumped in it now. I know y'all never going to forgive me for this. Can I say this to you? It is not God's will for you to go to hell. <laughs> I know you're screaming at your you're screaming at your computer right now, friends. Uh. Uh, hell wasn't created for you and it's just a terrible circumstance that will put you there but please friends let me just say this to you uh, God doesn't want you to go to hell he doesn't will any of you it is not God's will his W-I-L-L -L. it is not God's will it's not his intent uh, let me read to you from third, from 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 uh, uh, Brother Peter is talking about the, the day of the Lord, which is a thousand years. It's not 24 hour period. Don't get hung up on that. Uh, the day of the Lord is, we're living in the day of the Lord or headed to the day of the Lord. We're, we are in the eighth day of creation right now. Remember the seven days of creation, the six days he created, the seventh day he rested. What day are we in now? We're in the eighth day. Holy cow. Look at verse 8. Speaking of the eighth day, this is third, second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with a day with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slow, slowness. He's talking about well, how come Jesus hadn't come and ended this thing yet. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. God wants everyone 
to repent. And God wants everyone saved. It is the will of God. Jesus came to earth. He died on the cross so that everyone will be saved. Is everyone going to be the saved? No. Few find the way. But that doesn't change God's heart for the lost. He would have come yesterday. He would have come five years ago. He would have come 2,000 years ago. He would have come a week after the resurrection if there weren't so many lost people on earth. The Bible says he delays his second coming out of mercy to give other people a chance, more people a chance to repent and believe the gospel so that they can be saved. God, it is not the will of God that any should perish. That's King James Bible, but that all come to a saving knowledge of him. God's will is his word. It's not a mystery. He tells you what his will is. Somebody give me a hallelujah. All right. Friends, we, we said earlier in the sermon as kind of an off-the-cuff remark because I just, I, I, that's not the sermon, that uh, the torment does not change a bigoted heart. If you are bigoted against people uh, who are different than you or... Uh, uh, lower, lower socioeconomic, racial, uh, you know, they, they were born in a different state than you, a different country than you. If you carry that kind of bigotry in you, I mean, a man in this church told me one time, he didn't want Mexicans coming into a church, said in a board meeting. <laughs> he hired them to work around his place, but he didn't want them in the church. He's a bigot. <laughs> May I say this to you, my friends? Uh, that was said in this building. Let me say this to you, friends. Uh, the flames of hell doesn't change that. You will live with your bigotry forever. Father Abraham, send that boy over here. Send that spick over here to dip his finger in the, in the water and... Hey. Uh... That doesn't change. Hell doesn't change that. You got to live with that forever. Let me say this to you, friends. Can I tell you that the worst thing about being in hell is not the flames. It's not the torment. It's, it's listen, the, the rich man told us, you missed it. I missed it. We missed it. We read this passage. I know that maybe you didn't read this passage as an adult because you went to a church that didn't like to preach on it because, you know, I don't like to preach on it. And maybe you went to one of those uh, don't worry, be happy churches, sensitive, seeker churches that maybe you went to a liberal church and they don't believe in this at all. Here's what I want to say to you, friends. The Jesus has taught us today in this scripture and Abraham taught us today in this scripture and the rich man taught us today that we have three witnesses in the scripture to one central truth torment is not the worst thing about being in hell the worst thing about being in hell is who you're in hell with and I don't mean Hitler and Mussolini and 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 uh, Genghis Khan or, or uh, Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein or Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer might not be in, be in hell, by the way. You, you know he was converted. I know. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. But people like that, son of Sam, you know, or is that the scariest part of being in hell? No, no, friends, it's not. The scariest part of being in hell is being in hell with your with your family. That's the part of hell that, that got the rich man's attention. He didn't care about Lazarus. You, you heard that. Once a bigot, always a bigot. Until Jesus changes your heart. 
What he didn't want to be in hell with was his brothers. He had five brothers. I guess he didn't marry, didn't have any kids, maybe. If he did, he didn't care anything about them, but he loved his brothers. Let me go back to my father's house and warn my brothers. I don't want to see them down here. You see, friends, you, you have to live with that. You have to live with being in torment. I mean, I can't, I can't, I cannot, I mean, I have never, I mean, from the time, from the time Sue Ellen and I got married and we were living in Sherwood Forest Apartments on Briarwood Drive in Jackson, Mississippi. Isn't that weird? Not far from here, about 15, 16 miles from here. Eva, I couldn't, you know, I would hate to know I live there now. That was 1984. And Sue Ellen comes home and she says, I'm, I'm pregnant. And we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl or, or anything like that yet. She was brand new pregnant. Can I tell you what I did? I got on my knees and I prayed to God to forgive me of my sins. And I got rid of everything that would cause her to stumble. She was eight months or seven months yet before she was born. And I, at night, every night when I said my prayers, I laid my hand on Sue Ellen's stomach and I prayed for that baby. And I prayed for that baby to be saved. And every, I made a decision that my child was going to grow up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And, and, and both of our children did. Now, they have free will. They can do whatever they want. But, but I'm telling you, as far as me, as far as I was concerned, uh, I was bringing them to church. I was, and I know, you know, Olivia joined a soccer league and she loved soccer and all that kind of stuff. And so I missed one Sunday to, uh, to take her to the soccer field. We lived under the same pressure as you did. We had ballet and we had piano and we had all those kinds of things. But I'm telling you, friends, that Jesus was always number one in our life, for better or worse. For better or worse, it's just the way it was with me. And I just, to think about hearing somebody, you know, to hear about little Brennan. Can you think I want to be in hell for bazillions of years? The hell, the hellfire is unquenchable. And listen to little Brennan uh, talk to me and say, why, Papa? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why, Papa, why didn't you tell me that to be saved? Why, Papa, why didn't you pour into me, Papa? Why didn't you do something, Papa? Why, can you get me out of here, Papa? Can, I cannot listen to that. I will not listen to that. You know, I didn't know I didn't know much back in those days before so I got married, but I knew the Bible. I read the thing from cover to cover before I ever got married. And... Uh, and even though I ignored it, the moment Sue Ellen conceived, this very passage of Scripture came uh, front and center. Daddy, Mama, Mama, why? Why didn't we go to church, Mama? Why didn't you have me baptized? Mama, why didn't you teach me to believe in Jesus? Granny wanted to take us to church, but you wouldn't let her. You said there was nothing in church but a bunch of hypocrites. Mama, where are the hypocrites now, Mama? Where are they now? Friends, the most ghastly thing about hell is not the people you hate that are going to be there. It's the people you love that are going to be there. Friends, you need to listen to me. You need to listen to me. You wanted to hear this? You're hearing it. And I don't know any other way to candy coat this. Let me give you, uh, let me give you the, last, the last surprising thing about hell. You want me to go over them again? God did not create hell for you at all. He created it for the devil and the devil's angels. It's created for hell's angels. If that's in... Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. The second surprising thing about hell you may not know is it's not God's will for you to go there now. What and then? It's not now. Second Peter chapter 3. It's not the will of God that any should perish. Number three, there's something worse than the torment, than the, than, than the fire. And that is the people you love who are in hell with you. And number four, the last one, hell is your choice. <laughs> 
Hell is your choice. C.S. Lewis said the gates of hell are locked from the inside. It's your choice. It's your choice. So you can make a decision right now. You can make a decision right now and you never have to worry about it. You can make a decision right now. You can repent and believe the gospel right now. You can do it right now. You can do it this very moment. There's two, there's two, when you are offered a decision by an evangelist, and that's what I am today. If you can, if, if you're offered a decision by an evangelist, you have two answers, yes or no. And if you say yes, then you repent, you believe the gospel, and you start living like it. You start feeding the hungry. You start clothing the naked. You start healing the sick. You start evangelizing the lost. Faith that works is dead. You get off the bench and get in the game. You don't come to church to run the church. You come to church to build the kingdom. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Dear God, do you hear what I'm telling you? And the other choice is no. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right, that's fine. But people think there are third choices. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm going. I'm coming to the. I'm coming, but I'm going to wait. You know, I've got other things to do. I'm going to wait till I'm a little older. I'm out sowing my wild oats right now. You're 60 years old. <laughs> I'm sowing my wild oats. Are you really? You're gonna wait till your deathbed, friends. If you're gonna, if you wait till the midnight hour, you're gonna die at 11:30. If you say, uh, if you say, you either say yes or you say no. If you'll say, I'm gonna wait till later, that's no. If you say, give me some time to think about it, that's no. Say, give me some time to pray about it. I'll let you know later. That's no. Your answer is either yes or no. What's it going to be? Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, it's been too long since I uh, preached a sermon on hell. I'm so sorry that I have ignored. I know, Lord, you said in Ezekiel, when we ignore when we ignore preaching these passages in the blood of those who needed to hear it but didn't, their blood is on our hands. And so, Lord, I accept that as a rebuke. And so, Lord, I, uh, I repent. And, Lord, I pray that every person watching can repent. Lord, they, they know that heaven, that heaven is real, and he if heaven's real, hell, hell is too. And they know now that you didn't create hell for them. They know now it's not your will for them to go to hell. They know now that, that, that the flames of hell are not even the scariest part of hell. And they know now the ball is in their court. It's their decision. They have been told that very clearly. This is the, the clearest. There, no, no jokes, no following any of my silly stories, no telling any of my little funny things. Uh, they know, Lord, I have, I have absolutely called anything superfluous from this sermon. It is as clear a clarion call to repent and believe the gospel as I am able to do, Lord. So I pray, Holy Spirit, only you, only you can convict and bring these good people, these lost people, to Jesus for salvation. I can preach the word, but my responsibility stops right there. Holy Spirit, you do. You do what I only you can do. And I pray right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, most Sundays I don't ask you to do this, but some Sundays I do. I never know, really, until I watch this, how it came out. You will see this before I do. 
we don't run this through the through the uh, through a filter. <laughs> Uh, God knows we need to. Here's here's what I want you to do. I uh, I ask you, Lord. I I ask you, Lord, to lay it upon the hearts of these people to share this video. Friends, I know that you're not uh, probably not an evangelist, and I know if you're anything like me, you're not that comfortable with uh, preaching or being preachy or anything like that. And, and some of you don't feel really like you know enough scripture. But you can do one thing for me, friends. You can, And don't do this for me. Do this for Jesus and your friends. I want you to share this on your YouTube and Facebook or whatever you have. This, this, this message has got to go out today. And what you might want to do is just choose a few people and, and email it to them. And you, it, that's risky because uh, they're going to think you're judging them. And you're not judging them. You just want to be sure that the people that you love the most are going to be with you when you get to heaven. Don't send it out because you're judging them. Send it out because you love them. And, and, and they will understand that, and they will thank you for it. They might not thank you for it today, but they will thank you for it eventually. Or they'll wish that they had watched it. I, uh, you know, people are responsible for the preaching that they've received or the preaching that they should have received. Did you know this? If, if, you, if you miss church today, live church, uh, you're still responsible for what was taught. You stayed home because you were mad. You're mad at Christian, you're mad at Scott, you're mad at Carl, you're mad at somebody. You went fishing today. You're still responsible for what got preached. And on Judgment Day, when God judges you, he's going to say, well, Brother Scott told you about that. And you're going to say, no, he didn't. I wasn't there that Sunday. And the Lord's going to say, and whose fault was that? You should have been there that Sunday. But you had your panties in a bunch. And you didn't come. Friends, don't do that. Don't play those games with your own soul. Don't do that. Help me get the word out. People need to hear this. I love you. Next Sunday, we start October. I'll see you then. But spread the word. Hell's not for you. You don't have to go there. He didn't create it for you. He, he has not willed you to hell. He's not going to will you to hell. Listen, there's worse things than fire, but you don't want to go to hell. You can avoid it. You can. Jesus came and he died for you to get you out of hell. Now act like it, somebody. I mean, rise up, people of God. Come on now, let's go, let's go. I'll see you next week. <laughs>